<clears throat> when you get to be 71 years old, which I am now, and have been doing the same thing for a while, either you don't know what you're doing or you eventually start to achieve some things and um, even get a little bit of recognition for it. So um, in my case, I've been very fortunate to have received a few awards, awards including the uh, lifetime achievement from this organization, of which I am extremely proud. But probably the thing that I am the proudest of is that I actually made it to the cover of Rolling Stone. Well, not exactly. I, it wasn't the cover, but I was mentioned in one of their annual Who's Doing Important Things. And the fact is, I was in Rolling Stone, uh, and <laughs> unfortunately, um, I have to say, not that many people read Rolling Stone anymore, at least not people that follow my work, but there were a couple of people from the Air Resources Board, uh, techs from the lab, who do, and who got me to sign their, uh, sign their magazines for them. So I was, I was very, very happy to be able to do that. When uh, my daughter, who is a lawyer and uh, now the uh, head of uh, staff of a staff of a of a committee of the United States Senate on oversight and investigation. She's a Democratic uh, uh, chief staff person, was six years old um, and was asked what she wanted to be when she grew up. She said she wanted to be the first woman pope. And um, she, uh, I think she'd gotten that idea because she'd seen a documentary about the pope. Uh, and. Uh, she really, really liked the outfit, uh, as, as, well as, the, as well as the power. So we had to explain to her that there were two problems with her career ambition, which really would probably knock her out. Uh, the first was that we're not Catholic. Uh, but the second, and equally disabling, was the fact that she was a woman. Um, I look forward to the time when being the first woman anything is no longer uh, anybody's career ambition. And I know a lot of other people uh, in this room do too, even though many of you I recognize are the first woman in whatever position it is you are now holding. But that leads me to uh, reflect a little bit on the topic of this conference, the role of women, women in clean energy and, and what that means. And I realized that um, objectively, I probably don't have a lot to say because I'm not a student of this field. I'm just a, a person who happens to uh, also be a woman who has worked in the career, uh, in the field of uh, energy um, for now quite a long time. And um, what I think is both uh, exciting but also a little bit uh, daunting, at least, about the topic is that um, the fact is that in my lifetime, uh, women have achieved roles of prominence and visibility uh, beyond anything that uh, certainly seemed possible. 20, 30, 40 years ago, and, and you heard some statistics about the numbers of women who are energy ministers, uh, women heading up all kinds of important uh, organizations. Probably the woman who has inspired me the most in the last uh, few years was uh, Christiana Figueres in her role as the head of the Conference of Parties that uh, achieved the, the accord in Paris. And I say that because um, I identified very much with her um, way of approaching uh, that uh, task, which was to take on something that when she started it seemed pretty much impossible. And uh, with determination and a willingness to simply uh, state that an agreement was going to happen and then to work tirelessly to make it happen, she, in many, many ways, uh, is responsible for having made it so. Now, it couldn't have happened without a lot of other conditions. Uh, having been present, the, the, the world beginning to recognize that uh, you could not put off dealing with the problem of global climate change and that um, everyone was going to have to play a role. The willingness of um, diplomats around the world to shift the field on which they had been arguing and to come up with a, a different approach from the one that had been tried at Kyoto and that didn't work. 
uh, the fact that both developed and developing countries were working together before the conference. There, there are many, many other factors and many other people who played absolutely essential roles in getting to the Paris Agreement. But uh, I really do feel that her kind of inspirational leadership is something that um, we should all admire and aspire to in whatever field it is we are working. So um, it's nice to know that even uh, as you go along, there, there will emerge people who are, who are heroes and, and role models, and I was very glad to, glad to find one in her. Um, I also uh, thought as a, as a uh, prior recipient of this award, of the, uh, of the Lifetime Achievement Award from this organization that I would say a couple of words since I wasn't able to be here when I actually received my award um, about how I got into this uh, in the first place because uh, I didn't start out my career intending to work in the field of energy. Um, I think we could probably start with the fact that my father, who was a professor of engineering at uh, Cornell when I was growing up as a kid um, uh, was horrified when he found out that I had been appointed by Jerry Brown to the Air Resources Board for the first time and was in a position to be making decisions about the future of the automobile in the, the United States because uh, my father very well remembered how hard it had been to pull me through seventh grade general science and so uh, that was kind of uh, he was still stuck on you know what was I what was I doing working in this field but I approached uh, my interest in energy from the perspective of clean air and of being a lawyer and not a scientist I have been uh, very fortunate in my career that I've been able to work with uh, amazing scientists and engineers in tackling California's air pollution problems and then moving into the what I think of as sort of larger scale air pollution uh, problem of greenhouse gases as they are uh, as they are in our atmosphere and continue to be continue to be building in our atmosphere but um, I started out as a as a young lawyer who wanted to make a difference, did not want to work in a corporate law firm, wanted to do something exciting, interesting, cutting edge, and what was new and exciting and interesting and cutting edge in the early 1970s was environmental law because Congress had passed a whole slew of, of uh, environmental laws, including the, the first really serious uh, Clean Air Act, and um, it contained in it a wonderful uh, provision which uh, was unique at the time and has never uh, been seriously replicated called the citizen suit provision, which allowed for any person uh, to go into court and sue either a polluter or the government and to uh, seek an injunction to force action. This was what we were looking for. It was an opportunity to actually use the legal system to force change. And, um, and I and many other colleagues and friends and people at NRDC, among others, uh, did just that uh, on behalf of organizations like, uh, like the Lung Association and community organizations, coalitions of people who were sick and tired of smog and who wanted to see something done about it and were tired of the political compromises that led to um, their government taking the attitude that it wasn't realistic to ask people to do things that might involve serious changes in lifestyle. So I spent many years of my life uh, listening to, participating in, and, and, and as a board member of the Air Resources Board, presiding over um, proceedings in which you had businesses on the one hand and environmental groups on the other hand arguing about um, whether doing something to require cleaner fuels or cleaner vehicles would cost too much money, 
would um, end up hurting uh, the ability to uh, have access to um, important consumer goods like cars and gasoline or electricity, and whether if we did proceed with these um, very strong mandates that we were considering, uh, whether that would bring the economy of the state of California to a halt. And my views about the uh, EPA Clean Power Plan and many other things that are under consideration at the moment are completely shaped by the fact that we have seen time and time again that uh, looking to the science to tell you what the goal should be in terms of what the definition is for clean air uh, or for safe uh, emissions from any particular sector, um, and then uh, understanding enough about what's doable with technology to then uh, set strong standards uh, is, is really the only way to make progress, and it has shown time and time again that it also has economic benefits once the political consensus can be reached. Uh, we're now in one of those periods again with respect to climate change. Uh, there's been a tremendous shift in public opinion in terms of the, the need to address the problem, but we're still fighting over the question of how to do it. And of course it's not, it's not simple and there will be costs to somebody, uh, in some sense to all of us, uh, but if we want to actually uh, save the planet, uh, we're gonna have to figure out how to, how to achieve those things and that includes um, increasingly sophisticated ideas about how to use finance, use policy tools uh, to achieve those goals. But it, it is about technology, of course, uh, uh, but it's also about smart policy and harnessing the uh, benefits and the, and, the, um, and the skill and the expertise uh, that we have uh, in, in the financial community to make those things happen. When we approached the problem of how to implement California's Global Warming Solutions Act, which was uh, passed just before I came back from my second uh, time as, as uh, chair of the Air Resources Board, and by the way, I was appointed uh, by a Republican governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, before I was reappointed by, by Jerry Brown, by my, my, first, my first governor. Um, it, was, uh, it was the job of the Air Resources Board, and it was handed to us because we were seen as an agency that had been successful in um, harnessing all the regulatory tools and finding incentives and market programs to deal with the problem of smog. It was considered that Airb was the right agency to develop a plan for dealing with global climate change for California. And what we did was to approach it in essentially the same way that we had gone about tackling the air pollution problems in California uh, beginning back in the 1970s, which is first, figure out what the problem is, you know, what your sources are, get a good inventory. Second, look at who's out there, who's actually responsible for, for um, emissions, and then figure out uh, systematically how to put together a mix of source-specific source or sector-specific uh, regulations and um, also have a cap on the total amount. So. The program that we put together for California in our first scoping plan, which consists of both a cap and trade program, which is the thing that's probably garnered the most attention, uh, but also uh, a series of specific rules that built on um, our experiences in, in regulating in the areas of energy and transportation, put together turned out to be, from a macro perspective for the state of California, probably the, the most cost-effective way we could have gone about doing it. And although um, various aspects of the program remain controversial, uh, and probably always will be, I suppose, um, overall we've seen a tremendous amount of um, acceptance and, and frankly success uh, in, in moving forward in terms of reducing overall emissions. So I can't tell you that this was all easy, but it was made enormously easier by the fact that there were so many people in this state who uh, remember what it was like when you couldn't see the mountains or you could not 
uh, play outside if you were a kid or where it hurt uh, to go out and breathe the air in Los Angeles uh, not that long ago and know uh, what it took to clean it up and that it's going to take a, a fairly similar, although uh, even more dramatic uh, effort to, to get to the next step. Um, fundamental change in the way we use energy is essential to all of this. And my interest in energy really stems from the fact that having been involved all these years in the after effects of what comes out of our tailpipes or out of our uh, uh, out of our um, stacks uh, at uh, power plants and refineries and so forth, you quickly begin to realize that there's a deeper uh, issue here about uh, how we actually are making and using energy, and that's what we have to find ways to tackle. Um, we do it here in California through partnerships of all kinds uh, with anybody who's willing and able to partner with us, including, of course, an enormously important to us uh, relationships that we've had with academia over the years. While the state has not had as much money to put into basic research as uh, I think any of us would have liked, we've been able to help to uh, leverage money from a lot of other sources, in, and we've had the tremendous cooperation and support of both our private and uh, public uh, research institutions and of the students who come out of these places wanting to um, take on important jobs and, and make a difference. Uh, one of the most fun things that I've actually ever done in my career was when I was at uh, UCLA, I got to be the, uh, the den mother for the Student Sustainability Coalition, which morphed into a campus-wide sustainability initiative that's now been uh, completely embraced and is being carried on at a much higher level than anything we dared to hope for um, when, I was, when I was working with the students. But um, it, it showed uh, the, who has the true power in the institution, which is actually the students. So it was a, it was a, great, a great effort. And many of those students, uh, as with many of the other people that I've had an opportunity to work with over the years in the legislature uh, and, um, and uh, in the corporate sector, uh, as well as in government, uh, were and are women. And I suppose the fact that it has become a field that has attracted so many very, very smart and uh, public-spirited women um, is a sign that it's a, an activity that's truly worth spending time on. So I think that's probably enough for my official uh, comments to you today. I just want to really acknowledge and uh, praise those of you who are here and uh, tell you how much I enjoy having you as colleagues and fellow workers and um, look forward to uh, taking some questions and having a little bit more of a conversation here while you finish your lunch. Thank you very much. Hey, Mary. Why don't uh, we we'll just let's sit in the middle. Maybe we won't cut off so many people on the side. Damn, I'm excited to be back in California from, uh, from my new move to Geneva and uh, Switzerland. Yeah, not, uh, not the many other Genevas that exist here in the US. But um, I, I think what we have here today is a tremendous um, gathering of public, private sector, academics, international and US passionate um, women and, uh, and men. And so I guess maybe um, if I took a thread out of your comments, it was really about the importance of public-private partnerships to get anything done. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the governor's set a very ambitious agenda now with the MOU at an international, sub-national level, right. uh, with this sub-2 that they're going to be talking about tomorrow. But advice to this group, as you, they think about going forward and putting together public-private partnerships to get things done, what, what, would, what advice would you give? Well, first of all, there's no time to start like right now, and, and certainly not to be afraid to reach out and try to make those kinds of connections. I think um, it's hard in our society, which is a very adversarial society, and one where uh, we sometimes find ourselves fighting in one arena while still trying to talk in another. Yes. And I've had the experience uh, many times of having private, quiet, off-the-record conversations with people who uh, 
were also working in organizations who had hired lobbyists to try to destroy my program um, in the legislature or, uh, or at the ballot box. Yep. And it doesn't particularly make me happy that that's the case. In fact, I, you have to be able to carry on what sometimes can be a very, very uh, strenuous battle mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to uh, maintain public support, to maintain political support for what you're doing. But at the same time, if you're not doing, if you're not also able to have the conversations with the people who, uh, who obviously uh, feel concerned enough about the program so that they're uh, they're willing to fight you on one hand, mm -hmm. then um, you're, you're missing the opportunity to settle it because I think maybe one of the things that I probably could have mentioned early on that I learned was that in working for a public interest law firm which uh, was devoted to litigation, litigation is war by other means as they say, um, somebody wins and somebody loses generally if you go all the way to court. But what you find is that often you win and you haven't won anything. And that was certainly true in some of the cases that we brought under the early Clean Air Act. And it's true today of groups that are suing and blocking projects or suing to stop things that, um, you know, where they're, what they really want is a change in the project as opposed to actually to stop it because if they stop it, then you lose uh, the resource of the, the company or the or the entity that you're suing which could have been devoted to doing more of what you wanted them to do so you have to find some other way to uh, to get a settlement or to get a resolution other than uh, than just through battles of legislation or litigation and that is about partnerships even though the term partnership may sometimes seem a little too friendly for what's mm -hmm. really going on. Uh, the reality is that without a level of co cooperation and partnership, you, you really don't ever achieve the results that you set out for. Yeah. Well, and I think you said something really important in your comments that the idea of agreeing on what's the problem we're trying to solve, right. which often can bring people to the table without having yet been friendly, but at least right. agreeing what are we gonna have a conversation about. And yeah. uh, before you comment on that, I just want to say we're, I'm going to go right to questions from the audience. So get your questions ready, your hands in the air so that the mics can get to you um, and we can jump right in. All right, your comment. <laughs> well, my comment on that was just to say that um, the uh, idea that the person on the other side um, doesn't have something of value to offer in mm -hmm. terms of reaching a solution is probably going to prevent you from achieving what you could achieve. In other words, none of us has a monopoly on truth. And yeah. no matter where you are, you can learn something from people who seem like they're your adversaries. No, absolutely, really wise words. Um, I think I see a microphone over here. You can let us know who you are and where you're from. Hello, uh, Dorothy Barnett. I'm from Kansas. I direct the Climate and Energy Project, a nonprofit focused on clean energy, energy efficiency. Um, so, so you mentioned the clean power plan. Um, you know, one of the things we had high hopes for that was going to be moving expeditiously to talk about um, reducing carbon. What advice would you have for those of us who work in states uh, who have stopped progress on moving forward with the clean power plan, um, or um, any insights into where do you think we're headed um, in regards to? Uh, carbon regulations. Thank you. Well, first of all, I do think that progress on clean energy is unstoppable with or without the clean power plan. So I'm, I'm happy to see that for reasons of economy, reasons of prudence, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, um, both governments and uh, private sector decision makers are increasingly looking at ways to put more renewables into their energy mix and to phase out the highest carbon sources of power anyhow. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, and again, I don't, I don't think that will stop no matter what happens to the clean power plan. However, I also think it's important that the clean power plan get upheld and be carried out possibly with some modifications, because without it, I don't see how we get to the regional 
markets in energy that are going to be the most cost-effective way for states and energy regulators and utilities to actually get the carbon reductions overall that we need. So without the ability to take advantage of the regional energy markets that already exist, uh, which the, uh, the clean power plan really provides the impetus to do that, you can have uh, exhortations, you can have you know, the thought out there, but it probably isn't gonna happen it, without having that uh, forcing function of having to actually produce a plan. I mean, the, when the Clean Power Plan came out, the loudest uh, opposition really came from public utility commissioners at the state level in states where they saw their regulatory authority being um, uh, cut back and, and were shocked to find this happening. They'd never before been outflanked by, especially by this annoying, you know, Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean Air Act, which they'd sort of succeeded in um, ignoring for many, many years. Now suddenly they're actually subject to this, uh, you know, kind of a plan. But I think the EPA plan itself, if they can manage to implement it and enforce it in a way which is as, um, deft as they've at least been indicating they want it to be, um, I think could be the best thing that ever happened to people who are interested in having successful regional uh, energy marketing. So it just doesn't make any sense to stop at state borders with electrons. And uh, that is one good thing that we learned a long time ago about clean air, which is you just you can't do it on a state-by-state -state basis, even if legally the state is yep. the entity that has the responsibility. So yeah. hopefully the same thing will happen. Excellent. Uh, we had a question right here. Uh, my name is Wei Pan. I'm a grad student from Princeton University. So my question is exactly the follow-up of the last comment you made just now, because like you mentioned that you compare the policy-making process for air pollution and the carbon um, emissions. I'm wondering, and you also talked about some of the similarities of these processes. I'm wondering, what do you think is the largest difference when comparing these two policy-making processes? Uh, well, um, there are uh, uh, certainly different governance structures involved and a different history. Uh, one uh, in the energy sector, at least if we just uh, talk about electricity, um, the ideas about how to, how to think about it uh, really uh, emerge from a, a time when uh, states, cities, and others were eagerly trying to expand the energy network and to find ways to make it affordable and available as widely as possible. And that's, that's sort of the history of, uh, of, our, of our system. And it was very successful. Um, now we're asking uh, for a complete change in thinking uh, about energy and how we use it so that we treat it much more as a, as a service than a commodity so that we think about how to finance uh, the mm -hmm. service we need in new and different ways. Every entity that's involved in the process that is, or in the, in the system that we've created has to change. And, um, and that's wrenching and you know, sort of hard to do, whereas air pollution didn't become an issue really in this country until the late 1960s, and um, sort of, you know, those of us mm -hmm. in the um, environmental movement, you know, parachuted in and started, you know, knocking on the doors and saying, you've got to do things differently, but we were the upstarts. Well, now we're no longer upstarts anymore. Our way of doing things has also kind of shown its limits, and once again, we have to face another new, some other new ideas about how to change. Absolutely. Um, we have time for just one last question. I think I have a microphone right here. Yeah, thank you. One more question, Mary, about the Clean Power Plan. Um, so it's pretty much understood that the current plan can be met quite easily now that we have our tax extenders and good efficiency codes and standards, et cetera. It's no longer really going to move us to that deep carbonization that we all know is needed. And as a result, we're going to see over the next 15 years a whole lot of gas being built because that's all you need to do to meet the 2030 goals. But if you continue to 
uh, think beyond 2030, if you use policy foresight and assume we're going to need to go further, deeper soon, you wouldn't build all that gas, right? So we're going to have this big gas bubble built in the next 15 years unless policymakers can somehow be persuaded to think more long term. How do we do that? <laughs> well, um, a lot of us are searching for those answers right now, and certainly the way you stated the, the issue, I think, is, is correct. Um, I find myself in the in position of sort of trying to argue about where and how gas should be used, because I do think that there are a lot of ways in which it's a, a superior fuel to uh, what, what is out there but not all the ways in which people are urging that we use it, that's for sure. The only way I can think of to do it is to, um, is to have, a, as you say, a deep decarbonization philosophy, and that's going to have to get implemented both by moral persuasion and through economics. Uh, we're very lucky that the costs of renewable energy are coming down fast, uh, but governments and private sector entities are going to have to invest in a lot of smart ways to bring the cost down even faster and further. And, uh, and we're gonna have to be able to resist the temptation to do things in the name of easier transitions uh, if we're gonna get to the longer term goal. Um, we're focusing now on, uh, in, in my agency under the California plan and trying to get to 2030, but uh, as we begin to sort of factor in uh, all of the decisions that have to be made in the next couple of years, we're realizing that 2050 needs to be the target for everything that we're working on. And we won't know everything that we need to know in terms, about, uh, in terms of what technology can do. But the one thing I think we can be confident of is that every time we have tried to estimate costs, um, we've been wrong and we've always been wrong in over overestimating the cost. So with that knowledge, uh, I think it helps us to um, keep our eyes on the prize. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mary, for thank both you. your inspirational uh, leadership and your, and your wisdom today. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you, Mary, again. Thanks, everybody.